We're at Cognito Motorsports, one of the leading manufacturers of suspension components for trucks. If you've been around truck scene for a while, chances are you've probably heard of them. Now, what's so cool about today's video is that we're about to take you behind the scenes. Most of you guys see the finished product when it's installed on your truck. But today, I'm giving you an exclusive look at how these parts are actually made from raw materials to final product. You're going to see something that an average consumer never gets to see. It's pretty mind blowing when you think about it. Everything from precision laser cutting to the detailed welding work, it's all happening right here in this facility. This is what makes Cognito's products some of the best in the business and I'm stoked to show you all how it comes together. Plus, stick around because later in this video, I'll be sitting down with Justin Lambert, the founder of Cognito Motorsports, for an in-depth Q&A session where he answers some of your burning questions about truck suspension, performance upgrades, and what sets Cognito apart from the rest. This was the first one when we got under one roof that I was talking about when we got here in 2013. But it's changed a ton over the years. This used to be shipping and receiving. We used to have pallet racking going all the way down to powder coat. We used to assemble over in the powder coat area. Like once you get to a certain size and, and it starts getting cramped, I, I kind of identified that early. Luckily there was a empty lot across the street. So we scooped up that lot and started building that building. So now much more functional shop, you know, much easier space to work in, that kind of thing. So really this is a manufacturing plant here. And then uh, as these guys assemble product and get it packaged, we transfer it across the street, which I'll show you guys that uh, towards the end. So we're going to walk all the way to the back where material starts coming in first. So we'll, we'll kind of go with the, with the workflow. So we're going to walk past all this stuff for now. ADHD is all over the place. <laughs> I just want to jump in there and look at that stuff. And this is where raw materials come in, whether it's bar stock on the racks there, tubing, or it's laser cut and bent parts that come in from our laser suppliers. Um, all materials really come in uh, this way that are gonna uh, go through the production process. So, like I said, we have two buildings. You know, when I originally bought this, uh, built this building, I kind of planned on being able to expand out this way. But after a couple of years, I realized we were gonna outgrow that as well, which is why I picked up that building across the street. If we ever, if, when we outgrow both of these, I'll have to sell this building and somebody's probably going to need a yard so I didn't want to take up my yard. So we've added C trains and that's where we categorize a lot of parts um, and fixtures and things like that. That C train there, that's actually a, a plasma tubing cutter. So it's a CNC plasma tubing cutter. If you guys have heard of a, a dragon, that's what that is in there. Um, my goal is in the next couple of years to go CNC uh, laser tubing cutter. So laser tipping cutter. That'd be the next step up. Uh, someday we'll be there. Uh, but right now we're cutting all our tubing in house. Yeah, so like this tube was cut on that machine. You can see it's got an angle cut there. Um, and then we bend it on the CNC bender. And we can do, you know, long, long angle cuts like that even on that machine. So. That's pretty neat because we used to set up on a, on a miter saw, band saw, and then we would, to do notches, we would set up on a milling machine and use hole saws. I mean, that's what I did back in the chicken coop days. Uh, but now we got machinery like this, where you can knock out, you know, tubes with fish mounts on them, um, kind of ready to go, so. If you've seen a lot of Cognito lift kit stuff and you've paid close attention, you've seen a couple different styles of spindles. You've seen welded spindles and you've seen cast spindles. Welded spindles start with this base plate right here. So this is a forged base plate. So you can see it's got the, the lower ball joint. The brake caliper, bump stops, it's all forged steel, one piece. So with that, I can build a four inch spindle, seven inch spindle, 10 inch spindle, because I'm just adding on my upper ball joint and my tie rod piece. That's the way we have been doing stuff, but we're starting to get away from that and go to cast knuckles because we're just getting so busy. I would need two of these facilities in order to weld all the spindles you know, that we need. So we're switching over to cast knuckles, but we're designing those knuckles here. They're you know, to our strict standards, so super high quality, very nice knuckles.
we're if we're cutting bar stock or tubing, you can see the the little the mini door uh, in the wall there. So our our raw material from outside goes on the rollers, comes through that window, and that automatic bandsaw will chop it up. I mean that thing is amazing. You program how long you want the pieces and how many you want. As long as it has material to cut, it will cut, and you can walk away from it. So pretty neat. This is just a miter bandsaw. So this area we have some manual machinery, mills, lays, that kind of stuff. Um, but then this beast right here is a CNC tubing bender. It's actually a, a mandrel CNC tubing bender. So we're cutting tubes out there on the Dragon and then bending CNC style right here on this machine. The CNC, you know, the, the benefit here is we just get repeated accuracy out of these parts. If you're bending five parts, you don't really need something like this, but when you're bending 200 and you want them all to be the same, this is the machine. So essentially, when we go cut a notch tube on the Dragon and we bring it over here, this thing has a camera system and it will rotate the tube until it finds its picture where it wants that notch. Now it knows where the tube is and then it will go and do its bending program so that your notch is clocked properly with the bend. So yeah, really useful machine. Really high-end and expensive stuff, but you know, for us, um, we're, we're getting good use out of it. Mostly MIG welding here, and if you listen to the weld, it's not going to sound like your normal MIG welding. Like you've probably done some welding, probably sounds a little different. This is pulse MIG welding. You heard of pulse MIG? You hear the difference? You still you still hear a little crackle, but it's got this hum to it, right? So we do a lot of pulse MIG welding, which gives us a lot of penetration in that material but also lets us go faster and have less splatter. So you're gonna hear the difference, but let's, let's walk through here. That's well. You hear the, the, the buzzing? Yes. So, Outside, I was showing you. I was showing you the spindle bases. So here's an example of a four-inch spindle. So we took that forged steel spindle base, welded on our components to build a four-inch lift spindle. Again, we can build a seven-inch spindle or a ten-inch spindle. But uh, this is, it takes a lot of work. They're heavy parts, um, a lot of welding, and uh, you know, like I said, we're going to start phasing these out and going to cast. Ductile iron knuckles. Again, our design, our standards, that kind of thing. So all these parts are getting staged for surface finishing, which I'll show you guys next. But uh, so we've got eight welding booths where we're doing MIG welding, and some of them are a combination of MIG and TIG welding. But then we have a robot welder as well. So as you, you guys are probably aware, we have a good name for upper control arms. And we weld so many upper control arms that we have a robot welder uh, program to weld these control arms. So, Danny here has his buddy who uh, is the welding machine that doesn't really call in sick hardly ever, so that's awesome. Um, but Danny's able to get in his shift, him and his buddy, the robot welder, are able to get 70 to 80 uh, control arms out a day on shift. So, We've got you know, higher volume, um, like I said, during the during the pandemic when volume was pouring in, the demand was pouring in, we worked on processes and that was, that was welding and blasting and coating and, and assembly processes in order to get this product as accurate and, and as good quality as it could be um, and getting the most out the door to meet demand as possible. People don't like to wait for their product. You know, they want to spend the money, they want to get the product as soon as possible and, and enjoy it. And so our, our business model is build to stock. We're not build to order, we're building to stock. So we've got a lot of product in the warehouse so that we can try and deliver ASAP.
This is a, a spinner blaster machine. So rather than having to drag these into a blast room where a guy's got to suit up, hook up air, and have this big hose to, you know, to blast parts, then he would have to flip the parts, blast the other side. This is a spinner blaster. So we hang the parts on these hangers. The hanger goes into that cabinet. And in three and a half minutes, it comes out blasted. Two to three minutes to hang 30 arms, three and a half minute blast cycle, and then probably another few minutes to pull the arms off, the, off of the, the unit. But there's two hangers here. So while that's in the cabinet for three and a half minutes, they're tearing down the other hanger and reloading it with fresh parts. So you're literally switching in and out. But in order to do all this, you got a, you got a half a million dollar machine. Blasting used to be a bottleneck of ours. It is not a bottleneck anymore. But you gotta make investments like this. Yeah. They'll touch up some parts sometimes. So you saw Danny at the welder, the robot welder. He was doing a lot of the major deburring. Yeah. But before these guys powder coat, they will do some final deburring okay. just to make sure that their final product is gonna be gotcha. We don't want reworks. Goes from this, goes into that. And then it'll come out blasted looking uh, you, like this. You can see before we blast, we gotta put screws in these holes. These two holes are where that badge logo is riveted on. Yeah. If we don't put screws in those holes to plug them, we're gonna get shot in those holes and then you'll have stuff rattling around in the arms. Right. It doesn't matter once it's on the truck, but a lot of times, you know, you, you get a DIY, a do-it-yourself guy, pulls arm out of a box. If it's got a rattle, he, he's not gonna like it. Yeah. So we take these efforts and, and, and these measures to keep shot from getting in the arm so they don't rattle, you don't have stuff rattling inside. designed a custom rack and custom hangers for the control arms so that we can make our powder coating process faster. So when the control arms come out of that blast machine we just showed you, they're gonna go on this rack. This rack comes in the paint booth and it's powder paint. We still call it a paint booth because you're painting powder, right? Yeah. The guys have to transfer to hangers in front of the filters. You can see the arms hanging in front there. That's where the paint process happens and the circulation system draws the extra powder in the air, draws it through the filters there so that this isn't full of powder in here. Then the, the painted arms will go back on this rack and then this rack will roll out and roll into the oven for about 40 minutes. Some companies will not media blast their parts. They will use a phosphate wash. I'm adamant about media blasting because you get a better surface, a cleaner surface that the powder, the etch surface that the powder will, will adhere to better. If you phosphate wash, you're washing it with an acid and then washing it off with water, blowing it off, and then going through powder coat. We don't do that. We media blast. I want the powder coat to last a decade or more. If you don't do that, or and or if you under bake your parts, that coating is going to start chipping off in two years. So. You know, we want the stuff to last for the customers. We want, it should last the lifetime of the truck. You gotta have the right powder, you know, the right surface finish. A mill and two lathes. One of the lathes uh, being a five axis with live tooling. So Dennis is the pro over here. Uh, but rod ends like this. I mean, we're, we're building a lot of this type of, type of stuff here. Um, stainless spindle pins, things like that we're doing here. Um, so. This started out as a bar, okay? That was next process, that's finished part. That rack that was in the paint booth, but then transfers to the oven, but then transfers to the staging area where it cools off. Once it's cool, it'll come over here. And we've already run arms for, we've already run arms for the day, but this is where those control arms get assembled, okay? so. We've got a hydraulic power unit down there where we have three cylinders. Three cylinders, one to press in a ball joint, one for one bushing, one for the other bushing. So that control arm will come off that rack. It'll go to the first station here where it gets, uh, the badge logo gets ribbed on. 
Okay. So we have these nice stainless steel uh, branding badges that get riveted on the control arms. That happens right here. That operator will hand it to this operator. This is where he's pressing in the ball joint. So it's real important when you're pressing in a uniball or a ball joint, you gotta have, everything's gotta be squared up. So we use these different stands to position the pivot tubes of the arm to where the ball joint end goes in there. And they literally are pressing this button right here. And I think we'll press the ball joint in. Then they're coming to the next operator, installing the snap ring that holds the ball joint in place, installing the beauty cap that covers that whole assembly. Then it will come down to the next operator. He's going to take that control arm. First, he's going to slide two bushings on here, one on here, set that control arm on here. This is just a stand so he can lean the control arm against it. He's going to push this button. This one's going to press. He's going to push that button. This one's going to press in. Now the bushings are in the control arms. Now they're fully assembled at this point. Then they're going to come over here. And this operator is going to clean the arm, wipe off fingerprints, any, any grease left over, stuff like that. It's going to apply the sticker. So we're applying this sticker to the control arm, telling you a few things. For one, it's a right side control arm. We're also telling them, hey, modification of the frame uh, perch is required. Please read the instructions. That's very important so you don't damage ball joints. So we're putting those on the arm. We spend money on nice stickers so that they're not the cheapy ones that you try and peel off the yeah. arm and it doesn't all come off. Like uh, these I was come worried off. about that when I was peeling that sticker. Yeah, these come off nicely. And then we're wrapping the control arm in this blue film so that when it's in the box, it doesn't get, in, get scuffed up at all. So we're, we're, you know, we want to make sure as the end user, they get a nice part that they just paid for not scuffed up from any cardboard or any packaging. So we're, we're spending money on that as well. So now I'm gonna take you over to where we uh, package the control arm. But first, we'll stop and show you another uh, process that's needed before that. To make the box assembly or the packaging process faster, we're pre-staging foam. So we're building all these foam parts ahead of time, okay? So we have a certain amount of control arms that we know this rack, when it's full of foam, we can build a certain amount of control arms. So we're building all these foam parts ahead of time so that when we go to the uh, packaging process, it's like an assembly line. So we'll show you the assembly line. To make an assembly line work really smooth, it takes several team members. So you got, you know, one tech putting together a box, putting some paperwork in the box, then a piece of foam, like I just showed you the foam parts, then a control arm, more foam, another control arm, and then someone finishing off the box, putting the label on it, and then at the end of the line, stacking it on the pallet. We're using this space for a few things, uh, R&D, test fitting, you know, prototyping, things like that. So right now we've got my Tundra on the rack. Uh, we're working on a couple things, uh, some new products for the Tundra. Um, sometimes we'll have three trucks in here at one time. Today, it's just one truck. Mine, we're working on some new product again. The other thing we're doing here is prepping uh, my race car, my free runner for uh, our desert race team. We also do uh, UTV parts, UTV builds, things like that. So that stuff will happen here as well. But the uh, main goal here is, you know, develop truck product. That's again, our meat and potatoes. Um, so we have uh, one or two mechanics that work in this area that uh, are, are wrenching for us. And so when we have a new product to design, we're either gonna borrow a truck, buy a truck, uh, or whatnot, get it in here. We may tear this truck apart, scan it, then put it back together for a month or two while we develop parts on, on the computer and CAD, and then have some prototypes made, bring the truck back in, tear it apart, install parts, and test from there. Uh, so that's kind of, that's kind of the, the use of this area and that process. Dude, what are you doing? Shh. <laughs> hey, put one in there for me too. Put one in here for you? Yeah. It'll fit in the carry-on. Alright, let's go. Alright. Oh, oh, shoot. Put it back, put it back. We'll come back later. Tomorrow. I'll have somebody with it, I guess. I mean, you probably could. I mean, no, you definitely could. I, I think so. Good? Alright, sweet.
We almost had to return them to Cognito. I just say we're built to stock, so we've got a lot of stock. Um, you know, between our packages, bundles, shocks, springs, you know, all kinds of stuff. So if you look around here, all these red wrapped pallets are single skew packages or bundles, right? We call them P kits because there's a P in the part number. Um, but these are ready to go. So that's an entire kit, shocks, cross members, you know, rear block and U-bolt kit, hip and other support kit, control arms, you know, just depending on what kit they, you know, desire, it is on the shelf. It's a one part number order, very simple to order, very clear and concise, and it's ready to pick and ship. We use red because nobody else uses red. And if somebody receives a pallet and it is not wrapped in red, we want to know. They know, hey, somebody unwrapped my pallet. Find one that says 2020 HD with 12 inch lift and uh, we'll see if it fits in my carry on. All right. This is the most shocking aisle. Elka. Elka, huh? Go uh, they're a little bit out of my price range right now <laughs> but i want to try the cognito shocks when they come out so that's gonna be my number one that's gonna be actually this year this year yeah so i'll wait for the cognito shocks i'll be around single time he loves those elka shocks. elka was at sema two years ago they had a really small booth I was very surprised they came out with this big of a shot. Mm -hmm. Delco is known for power sports. Yeah, that's what I knew. Man. Look at, look at the amount of Elkas that they have here. Elka, Elka, Elka. And then very few King. And then a little bit of Bilstein. Oh, Bill Stein. There you go. This is cool. So judging by all the Elka shocks, I guess you guys sell a lot of Elkas with yeah, your kids. Yeah, we, we, uh, we do sell a lot of Elka shocks. There obviously are A movers, B movers, C movers. You know, we all know nowadays it's the HD, the 2020 and up HDs are the A movers. Right. Um, but yeah, in order to make sure we have enough shocks on the shelf <clears throat> to where if we get an order, we can send our kid along with it. You know, we got to make sure we have shocks on the shelf, but at least a, a small surplus of it. At least. Right. When the folks get an order, you know, we will stage the order over here and uh, rack it for the trucks when they show up. And then we'll load the trucks uh, from the docks here. So four docks. It's like we've already had trucks taking product out because those shelves are basically empty. So yeah, we'll have pallets on on those racks there. They already got bill of ladings on them. They're you know ready to go. So when the trucks start rolling in, um, we start loading trucks. And you've got an idler arm. So that pitman arm obviously is connected to a steering box, and when you turn the steering wheel, it's it's turning that. So all it's doing is this, okay? So that joint coming out of the pitman arm is just supposed to spin on axis. It's not supposed to go back and forth. It's not supposed to do this, mm -hmm. not supposed to do that. The reason it doesn't do that is because it has the either arm, okay? But this way, it doesn't have any support, okay? So what happens is that joint in the pitman arm and the one in the either arm start getting loose and it allows the center link to swing forward and backward. That changes your toe because mm -hmm. you, your, your drag link or center link is pivoting connected to your tie rods, connected to your spindles and your wheels. So as that thing pivots, now it pulls on the tie rod, and now you can't control your toe setting on your truck. You're gonna get premature tire wear, more tire cupping than normal. Front tires are gonna cup, because they're steer tires. You know, your front tires are steering. They're gonna cup. Mm. That's why we rotate, right? Um, well, I had burnouts, but. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say it. <laughs> but, you know, if you don't have control of the toe, they're going to cup worse. So we're actually saving, helping reduce tire wear in the front tires with the Pitman Eiler support kit. Mm -hmm. 
It actually saves a little bit of fuel. I actually had a fleet of trucks, a customer with a fleet of trucks that put them on their trucks. And, the, and this was a big fleet. Like they had, they collected data and they saw an increase in fuel mileage. Now I'm not going to say it was a mile a gallon. It wasn't. Mm. But you're talking a tenth of a mile a gallon so for a fleet that, that yeah. tracks their expenses. That was big to them. They're like, this, this paid for itself in two months. You know? So for them, it was amazing. Um, so Pittman Island support kit, and, and I mean, believe it or not, I, I, I designed that in a day. If you have any leveling kit, any brand, and you don't have the proper amount of droop travel, it's going to ride rough. Whether it's a Cognito kit, anybody's kit. You need to pick a kit and set it up properly. Install properly, set up properly. Set up means must have the proper amount of droop travel. If we have a three inch leveling kit and we maintain three inches of droop travel, the truck is gonna ride as good if not better than stock. If you crank that up all the way to five inches and you have one inch of droop travel or four inches and you have two inches of droop travel, the truck is not gonna ride good. It's not gonna ride as good as stock. It's very important that the setup is done properly. If you install a lift kit and you set it low, it is not gonna ride good as well. It's a different kind of ride. You're gonna be on the bump stops a lot. It won't ride that good. Started Cognito in a chicken coop in Arroyo Grande. So we're talking 700 foot long building, 50 feet wide, and I had 60 feet of it. So I started. Alrighty, so we're about to leave Cognito. I hope you guys enjoyed the content. I'm gonna go for a ride in Jaden's compound. Beast, 100, what, well, no, not 100. 1300 horsepower Duramax. But uh, yeah, keep on the lookout for this episode where I go over his truck and that L5P over there. But yeah, the overall, the what do you think about Cognito? Oh, it's awesome. It was pretty cool seeing how everything was made. Oh hell yeah! It was like an episode of How It's Made, Cognito Lift Kit Edition.